stages of treatment. Induction, getting somebody started on, on uh, buprenorphine. You've got to be in enough withdrawal. If you're not in enough withdrawal when you for take your first dose of buprenorphine, we can throw you into precipitated withdrawal. Same thing with the Narcan, right? You've still got a lot of opioids on the receptors, so you have to be sick enough. Stabilization. Finding the right dose where there's no more withdrawal symptoms, no more cravings, and minimal to no side effects. You can usually accomplish that in a week, couple weeks, um, certainly less than a month usually, but usually a couple weeks or so, we can get that right dose. Maintenance. Now you've got the right dose, it's a stable, consistent dose. This is where you're going to do counseling and figure out old behaviors, how to change that, developing new life skills, new coping skills. Again, there's the, I, I made this point in the first uh, talk, and that is people who want to do just the medication. I don't want to do no counseling. Can't you just write me the script for the subs, doc? Mm, no. We, you got to do counseling as part of this. We know people do better. It's not from Hazleton, but it is from uh, some other sources. Duration of treatment is controversial. Some physicians use the buprenorphine just as a detox agent. So you go in someplace, three to five days, take you up on the suboxone, I'll take you down when you leave, you're not on it anymore, good luck. Maybe go get counseling or go to meetings. Remember 1949? I told you to remember that number. 1949 when they first used methadone for detox, greater than 90% uh, relapse rate. Same thing. Same relapse rate. 65 years later, 66 years later, it's the same relapse rate. We'll get into why. Some docs use it just short term. Short term I'm defining as anywhere from one to three months or so. 70-80% relapse rate. This is the same people who go into a 28-day rehab program, inpatient, they come out at the end. 70-80% relapse rate. How come? Why such a high relapse rate? Well, when you've been doing stuff for a long time, it does not matter what the stuff is. It can be heroin, it can be pills, it can be alcohol. But when you've been doing stuff for a long time, the brain undergoes structural and functional changes. The brain is damaged. This is what we talked about last week in the first session. The brain is an organ that takes a long time to heal. Bust your leg, you're going to be in a cast for six weeks. Cast comes off, you're literally going to be off and running again. Bust your brain, brain on healing six weeks. Certainly not in 28 days. Some people say it takes a brain six to ten months to heal. Some people say it takes a brain nine to twelve months to heal. Most of the literature, evidence-based literature, says it takes a brain at least a year or longer to heal. Therefore, most authorities recommend continuing treatment with buprenorphine for at least a year. Remember this number. You're going to see this number come up again in some other contexts. This allows time for the damage to heal because you're not beating up that dopamine system. You're allowing that dopamine system to recover and to heal. And time to learn new behaviors, new coping skills. You can't figure out a new way of living life in six weeks, certainly not in 28 days. With a comprehensive program, which includes medication, education, that's what we're doing today, counseling, 12-step or other self-help, chances of long-term success can now approach 90%. And the source for that, it's this book, Healing the Addicted Brain. Again, I showed this slide last week, Hope of Healing. So this is um, a, a top of the brain, bottom of the brain. This is during active use. And I explained the slide last time. The, the, this is a slide that shows brain function. The brain does not actually look like physical Swiss cheese. It doesn't have physical holes in it. This is decreased function. And the point of it is that a year later of no use, it's smooth again. This shows the healing that can happen. But again, the point is a year. Again, another example, this is somebody who, who's been doing meth, and this is dopamine transporters. I d defined this last time. So an opioid comes along on the receptor, dopamine is released. The dopamine transporter is a chemical that brings the dopamine back into the cell. So this shows a healthy brain, 
this shows the damage, like before, the more red and more yellow, the healthier, so a lot of damage. This is just one month of abstinence. There's still a lot of damage here. There's not much healing in a month. 14 months, pretty good. Pretty good healing. I should point out meth, there's a lot of black holes here. Meth, meth is particularly nasty. Meth will get you in other areas of your brain. But this part shows, again, healing after 14 months time. It takes time to heal. It's in quotes. <coughs> Long article, statement, um, long title, Statement of the American Society of Addiction Medicine Consensus Paddle on the Use of Buprenorphine in Office-Based Treatment of Opioid Addictions came out in December 2011. So that's fairly, fairly recent. I'm a member of that society, the American Society of Addiction Medicine. It says, and I'm quoting right from the article, except in patients whose addictive disorders are of brief duration, the best outcomes happen with long-term medication maintenance with methadone or buprenorphine accompanied by psychosocial intervention. I've got to pause here for a moment. It sounds like I've been, in a way I have been, bad-mouthing heroin, uh, bad, <laughs> bad heroin, yeah, bad-mouthing methadone. All other things being equal, I think that buprenorphine is a better medication, but there's absolutely still a very real place for methadone. In many ways, treatment with methadone is a higher level of care. You got to go in every day. You got to be observed. You got to pee more often for them. So a lot more accountability. It's a higher level of care. For some people, it may be economics. They may not be able to afford this. Methadone may be more affordable. So there's still absolutely a place for methadone. Remember, the World Health Organization said methadone and buprenorphine are the essential meds. Still a place for methadone in pregnancy. So there's lots of places where methadone is still very legitimate. So I didn't mean to come off bad-mouthing it too badly. <clears throat> the optimum duration of maintenance is unclear, but may involve long-term, and for some people, maybe lifetime. Maybe lifetime maintenance. Similar to treatment of other chronic diseases like uh, hypertension, diabetes, or asthma. I'll, I'll explain a little bit about getting off and how that relates to diabetes. One of the misconceptions, one of the statements I made, by the way, about misconceptions, oh man, I'm hooked on this Suboxone stuff. It would be the same as somebody saying, oh man, I am hooked on this insulin stuff. Nonsense statement. But again, the analogy is there. Chronic disease, chronic medication support. I have patients who come in in the beginning, I ask them, do you have any idea of how long you th think you need to or want to be on Suboxone? And they say, well, I want to get off. My goal is to get off just as soon as I possibly can. Well, again, this is from these guys. They're saying the goal is not to get off. The goal is to have a good life. The goal is to have maximum function. That's the goal. So we covered these three stages. Last stage, taper. When you and your doc decide the time is right, the dose can be decreased slowly. Medical support can be provided to minimize withdrawal symptoms. So we approach a year. Somebody's been on Suboxone for a year. I'll be the one to bring it up. I say, hey, you've almost been on it for a year. What do you want to do? Some people will say, Doc, I am doing great. I am kicking ass. My job is great. It's never been better. I'm closer to my wife or my husband than I've ever been. My kids, I got my kids back again. Life is great. I'm using the tools that I got from you and 12-step and the counselors. I'm ready to get off. Let's do it. So fine, we start a taper process. <clears throat> Another scenario. How are you doing? Mm, not so good. I just got fired. Because I got fired, I'm about to get evicted from my house because of all that going on. I'm going through a divorce right now. I may end up living under a trestle sometime pretty soon. Um, probably not a good time to stop Suboxone. You're going to be at real high risk for relapse if you can still afford it, but probably not a good time to stop. The third scenario is the good one, doing great. But you know what? The Suboxone, it's not busting the bank. I can afford it. I don't mind taking it. I've gotten over the taste. I'm doing so well at this point, I don't want to rock the boat. So 
let me stay on it a while longer. We don't necessarily have to say forever at that point, but let's say we're going to stay on it for the foreseeable future. Let's say another six months or so. And then let's come back and we'll chat again and revisit the issue and see what you want to do at that point. Some people say, you know, I'm okay. I, let's just stay on it. But so again, there's lots of options. If you decide to, to come off, again, I can uh, give uh, medical support to minimize withdrawal symptoms. You're having muscle cramps, I can give you muscle cramp medicine. You got stomach cramps, I can give you stomach cramp medicine. You got sweats and chills, I can provide medication for that. I have a list of, for, for me, I have a list of eight medications that I can provide. None of them controlled substances, none of them addictive that can keep people more comfortable. Sometimes people get down to a lower dose and they start to feel really, they're not doing so good. Well, you can stop and just restabilize. This is that reverse tolerance that I was talking about. So you can restabilize and just maintain a lower dose. The person that was doing um, eight milligrams twice a day, um, I got a patient, I saw her earlier today. She is now doing a half of a two milligram Suboxone film twice a day. She's taking one milligram twice a day and doing great with it. Stable, lovely. I've got people doing two milligrams once a day. I try to tell people too about this taper business. So the analogy I use, it, some people really do, I, the, the guy I told you about in the beginning who's now down to two milligrams, he has as yet not used any of the comfort support medications that I have available. He hasn't used them yet. Um, I've got, I had one guy, um, he said that his biggest problem was uh, sweats. It was in January. He said, all I did was I walked outside for a while without a jacket. I cooled off. I did fine. I went back. He never used any of the meds. So some people have a relatively easy time. Some people have a dreadfully hard time with it. Some people are successful in getting off and some people are not successful. Some people can't stop. They can't get off. The analogy that I use here is coming back to diabetes. So you got diabetes. There's some diabetics. All you got to do is watch what you eat. And your, diabetic is, your diabetes is under fine control. Diet controlled diabetes. There's some people who need to take a pill, glucotrol, metformin, and their diabetes is under good control. Oral controlled diabetes. There's some diabetics who need to take insulin. For the person taking insulin, lose 50 pounds, do the support groups, do all of that stuff. Some people can get off of insulin and maybe switch to just a pill. There are other people who lose 200 pounds, become pure vegan, go to diabetic support groups twice a day, and they still can't get off the insulin. I make the same analogy with buprenorphine. So just because it's addiction, just because it's diabetes, there's different degrees and different types. And some are more severe, and some are, uh, can get off, and some can't. And it's okay. It's not a failure. You're not a failure if you can't. Again, just like the diabetic.